technology. His research interests center on multidisciplinary topics at the interface between spatial cognition and GI science, especially the area of geographic event conceptualization and the integration of cognitive factors and character, characterizations of dynamic spatial processes. So Alex will be talking this morning uh, about an overview of how courses from lynda.com are used to enhance the classroom experience in a spatial analysis course, Geography 464. Uh, Alex is also working to deliver dynamic content tailored to students' needs and interests through the evaluation of low-cost and free sketching tools. Alex and his colleagues have created sketch-based learning objects that complement students' blended learning experience and also create a systematic collection of topics that other researchers can contribute to. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Alex this morning for the COIL conversation. Thank you so much for having me and for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, not just uh, research, uh, but uh, actually the efforts that we are doing in the area of teaching and particularly teaching with uh, technology. So I've gotten interested in enhancing student experiences uh, for quite a while. And uh, we have always been looking for ways of doing that successfully. Uh, and then more recently, I came across uh, when I was uh, in uh, in Melbourne, actually, uh, in Australia, uh, the flipped classroom experiences. Uh, I know now that I could have come across this uh, at Penn State as well, but well, sometimes it takes a while uh, for things to th sink in. Um, and uh, what I started doing is uh, to, to think about essentially uh, low-cost versions of uh, flipped, uh, flipped learning experiences uh, because my experience is that uh, doing um, lecture material properly uh, often comes at a, a tremendous uh, effort. Uh, so it, uh, while I try to do that, it increases the appreciation of, uh, of people who do it right. Uh, and I was looking for ways to incorporate this flipped classroom and blended learning experience in my courses uh, without having um, like substantial funding for it. Um, what I found, uh, and that's what I would like to talk about primarily today, is that the university actually subscribes to an online tutoring system uh, called Linda or Linda.com, and uh, I for a while before I started using it in my actual class, I uh, had my students who are working with me uh, going through uh, the courses there that are related to the kinds of analyses that we are doing in our, in our uh, um, research and in my lab. And uh, I think this is a uh, um, wonderful opportunity and uh, I just would like to share my uh, experience. Uh, additionally, uh, we also have a COIL project, a COIL rig project uh, on uh, sketch-based geospatial learning objects and in sort of conceptualizing the uh, learning experience, I actually found that these two are very synergistically and um, I hope that I can show that uh, to some extent uh, in the sense that uh, we have a very detail-oriented technical tutoring system on one side and then we have a more conceptual-driven way of communicating especially spatial content uh, in form of the sketch-based learning objects. Okay. So, but without talking too much uh, on the first slide, uh, let me just uh, move you through a couple of uh, slides that uh, frame our research mo or, or um, the motivation for this presentation. So, blended learning and flipped classroom experiences uh, are currently hot topics in education. Um, you can, uh, what uh, Barton said uh, on the TLT symposium last weekend, uh, there were plenty of uh, presentations that uh, provided insights into flipped classroom experiences. Uh, these concepts are there to promote and enhance student learning and especially the student learning experience. Um, they are, from my perspective and from many other people's perspective, advantages or advantageous for 
especially technology and um, method-oriented courses because they allow students to practice and also to use a classroom time to practice. So the face-to-face -face time that we have uh, can actually be used in a very flexible uh, and new uh, and new way. Um, ideally, um, and that's what I tried to do partially, this time is used now to focus on concepts that are identified as being problematic in the preparation for course content. So uh, ideally, I can pick on topics that are troublesome to students before, and I know about them before they actually uh, come to class. Uh, the credo of uh, the flipped classroom experience from the uh, sage uh, on the stage, sorry for the typo, uh, to the guide on the side. And I think this is really true and it's really something uh, that is a wonderful way of especially teaching uh, technology and methods to uh, students. Um, I'm not going into too much detail. There have been other presentations that uh, are also available online that actually provide a lot of the scientific background uh, about studies that show that this flipped classroom experience actually do enhance uh, student learning and student uh, outcome. Uh, the challenge, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, is though that for like an ordinary lecturer like myself, uh, the time and of course resources are limited. Uh, so I was looking for ways to realize a flipped classroom experience uh, by myself, essentially. Uh, and um, what I try to do is uh, to um, uh, come up with resources that are easy to incorporate in my uh, current course uh, course content uh, so um, that I was essentially able uh, to leverage um, my uh, efforts with uh, existing uh, material uh, as I briefly mentioned in the beginning commercial products are available and then of course we have things such as Khan Academy, uh, Coursera, uh, and so on and so forth. But they are all not quite what I was looking for. Uh, so when I came across Linda, uh, it actually uh, convinced me pretty quickly because it is available um, at any time and uh, it provides information to a level of detail that is actually extremely, extremely useful. Um, what I also mentioned, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong buttons. Um, what I've also mentioned is sort of that the uh, two components that I combine are, are um, the Linda course for the bottom up technical experience and then the sketch based learning up for the top down conceptual experience. Okay, let me briefly talk a little bit about Linda. Uh, so, uh, Linda is, as I said, available uh, through Penn State. So, Penn State subscribes to uh, Linda and essentially offers an online training library. So uh, you can log on to Linda with your regular Penn State account. So it's essentially available to every student. Uh, unfortunately, not to uh, friends of Penn State. So there's uh, certain limitations in uh, accessibility. But once you are logged in, you have access to an incredible number of um, courses that are professionally prepared for specific contents. Um, and as I said, the focus is on technical aspect so that really the, um, uh, the, um, well, the way that, the, or the technical aspect so that this really the practical part is something that uh, are then becoming accessible at essentially uh, any time uh, to, uh, to students. Um, what I, uh, why I was happy with it is that I found a course that matches a lot of the topics that are addressing in my uh, courses. I'm teaching um, spatial analysis as well as advanced spatial analysis. So there's a lot of uh, statistics involved. And what is even more important is that we are moving uh, as a um, science and as a department in the direction of using a software environment that is freely available. Uh, it's called R, which is a tool or which is a collection of uh, statistical packages 
that uh, can be used in all kinds of uh, kinds of uh, context and uh, Linda is offering a course on R, uh, on statistics, and uh, uses R as sort of the tool to um, show the uh, show the content. Uh, and that, of course, was like a tremendous advantage because that allowed me to uh, use the content that I found on Linda, not as an entire course, but uh, very specifically certain sections that I could then uh, integrate into my existing existing syllabus. Uh, and I have uh, a short uh, short demonstration, uh, so that's just a, a screenshot. And I think uh, Brad is showing the video. <clears throat> um, I switch off the um, the audio just to uh, give you sort of my own um, take to it. So this is an environment. It's called R Studio, which is uh, the software that we are using to access R. Uh, Linda's R course has uh, uh, chapters and sections, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and uh, so that a specific content can be uh, addressed. What is important for me is that the information in this course is actually provided at different levels of abstraction. So there's the video itself, uh, then there's a transcript to the video. So you can, if you don't want to watch the video, you can just read about it. And then there are also scripts that are provided so that you can follow along with the actual uh, with the actual performance of uh, how certain statistical methods are applied to analyze data. Uh, and that's wonderful in the sense that once you went through the videos and you get an understanding of the content, you actually don't need the entire videos anymore. Uh, you start understanding the scripts and uh, can then, in a very efficient way, access, for example, how things are laid out uh, syntactically um, and how things are done without having to watch the entire videos again. So I'm very convinced about this uh, concept of offering uh, of offering uh, the um, course content in different levels of abstraction uh, so that uh, if you need to, you can go back later on. OK. so. That was the uh, that's the video, and it was just a short demonstration. But that's essentially uh, how it works. How this is then integrated into uh, my uh, courses. So this is a snippet of my uh, syllabus. So in uh, certain or at certain points during my uh, during my course, I require students uh, to work through uh, these uh, Linda chapters uh, and uh, perform. Um, and perform uh, challenges that then reinforce that they actually have um, have worked uh, through the course content. Um, I originally started to use the challenges that come with Linda. Uh, that is something, though, that I uh, relatively quickly abandoned uh, because uh, there are actually ways around uh, sort of looking at the solution without uh, me being able to control whether they watch the solutions or not. So and this is this is ideal uh, from the perspective of being able to teach uh, students a um, to teach students um, to teach students like technical aspects of spatial analysis and uh, statistics uh, in a way that they can do it at their own pace and do it at whatever time they they like. Uh, but also making sure uh, through these challenges that they actually went through uh, the material. Um, what we, what I then do in the lectures is um, I pick up these topics that they went through the in the lectures online and uh, design additional in-class activities that reinforce uh, that reinforce these concepts. So the effect then is that they indeed get this practice, 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 uh, which is essential, especially for things such as R, because it takes a little while uh, to actually get used to the environment and being able to understand and perform uh, certain types of analysis um, on, uh, on your own. The second aspect then, uh, and this is where it comes then a little bit more top down on the conceptual level, is the uh, COI project that we have in which we create uh, sketch-based geospatial learning objects. 
So the advantages of sketching as a way to communicate uh, concepts is that it's uh, fast, it's rough, it's kind of natural, um, it's not always pretty. Um, sketching separates concept from details, so it is a way of really focusing on what conceptually is important rather than uh, what how things are actually performed uh, and how things are implemented. Uh, sketching is for everyone, and I'm saying this despite me being an absolutely horrible artist. Um, uh, sketching is an effective tool for visual communication, and that's of course an advantage being in geography where a lot of things are visual. And everyone who has tried to explain spatial things in natural language terms uh, probably can also relate to the experience that if you can draw something, it is often a lot more enlightening than trying to put everything uh, into words. And then, uh, as essentially for myself, uh, so some insights actually come through the process uh, of sketching. So it's a reflective tool for uh, educators uh, as well. Uh, this is not really to, uh, to read, uh, but what we did as part of this uh, project is that we looked into numerous ways of actually doing sketching and doing sketching efficiently. Uh, there are a number of computer solutions that uh, exist and then there are also uh, tablet solutions. Uh, with the almost omnipresence of tablets, we eventually settled on tablets and evaluated a number of solutions for both uh, the iPad and Android and I just show the um, comparison that we did for uh, the iPad or part of the comparison so there are a number of apps that exist, uh, such as Explain Everything, uh, Brushes, uh, EduCreation, Show Me, and so on and so forth. Uh, they all have advantages and disadvantages, uh, so we try to uh, look at them a little bit more systematically, for example, whether they're able to capture uh, actions, whether they allow for recording simultaneously an audio uh, commentary, uh, how extensive their drawing uh, capabilities are, uh, whether they have video playback and export, uh, whether you also could, for example, export other media formats such as images, uh, whether you can insert pictures or videos, and whether you have the option, if you, for example, have a map that you would like to include, also use a pointer or um, uh, or other devices that help you sort of draw the attention to particular areas that you're actually talking about. So after doing that, we settled on uh, Explain Everything uh, as an app that allows a lot of things. This is just a screenshot of the uh, interface. I don't have um, uh, an explanation video for the interface it them itself. Uh, but I do have a little animation here uh, that um, encode information about the relationship between spatial entities such as states. So I'm switching off the uh, so audio now. So this is uh, one of those sketch-based learning objects that um, we have uh, created, that we have uh, uploaded uh, to uh, YouTube so that we can make it available through um, that we can make it available through uh, a very simple uh, internet uh, internet link uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm explaining the concept of a spatial weights matrix um, and I do that uh, by uh, providing a very rough sketch uh, and uh, um, and essentially draw while I'm uh, while I'm speaking uh, so the um, the map here uh, shows states. Uh, the states could be named just uh, A, B, C, D, E. And the important thing in this case would be to understand how we numerically and for a computer readable uh, can encode the spatial relationships between the entities. So for example, that uh, states such as A and B and A and C are neighbors, but that A and um, D and A and uh, E are uh, not neighbors. Um, I'm not showing the entire um, entire uh, video. I think that Brad has provided somewhere a uh, YouTube link. So if you want to, yeah, you can uh, watch it later on. Um, so just very briefly back to the uh, interface. So it's a 
simple interface uh, explain everything is a simple interface that nonetheless has a number of drawing options and we found it for our purposes uh, completely completely sufficient especially uh, as we are also able to incorporate uh, map materials and that makes it really into or turns it really into a flexible tool especially for explaining uh, geographic concept, uh, concepts so that was the example that I showed you about the spatial weights metrics the ultimate goal is to actually systematically organize these sketch-based learning objects that we are creating uh, so there are many obvious reasons for um, doing sketching especially in the geographic uh, content context um, but we are also trying to do it uh, systematically and uh, we started uh, by looking into what is called the body of knowledge uh, for geographic information science and technology that was first spearheaded by David DiBiase that many of you may know um, and uh, is now going into the uh, second uh, edition and uh, Anthony Robinson who is with me on this project uh, he is uh, part of the uh, team who is organizing the second uh, second edition so we are trying to be meaningful with our sketch based learning objects also to a broader audience uh, by looking into what are the core concepts that are identified uh, in this body of knowledge and which of them can we actually explain in form of the sketch-based learning objects that we are creating. So as I mentioned in the beginning, this is part of the blended learning experience that uh, we are creating for uh, our residential students in, uh, in, uh, in concert with uh, lynda.com at the moment. Uh, we are also looking into using these uh, sketch-based learning objects for uh, online courses. So there's a um, parallel course of GEOC 586 uh, that is uh, similar to uh, GEOC 464 that I'm teaching uh, residentially. Uh, the online material, uh, just to give you an idea, at the moment is organized in this uh, textual form. Uh, that uh, students work through there are certain concepts that are explained again these are concepts that also can be found in the uh, body of knowledge such as the modifiable area unit problem at the moment uh, students would click on it and then get a textual description and we have started to uh, enhance uh, this uh, explanation by also offering the sketch-based learning objects that we are creating uh, just to uh, some thoughts at the uh, at the end of my talk. Um, so I'm personally convinced that the flipped classroom experience is the way to go for technical courses. Um, as I said before, I'm not just using it in the actual classroom, but being able to provide course content of entire courses for. Uh, students, every student at every level, whether this is undergraduate or especially graduate level courses, uh, catered to specific needs uh, is something that is an absolutely wonderful uh, resource to have. Um, I am convinced about the Linda concept. I like the different levels of uh, abstraction and I like the way that the content is organized into chapters and sections so that it uh, really becomes modular and in this way it becomes very efficient uh, to uh, tailor it to particular needs and particular uh, particular questions. Uh, from my experience and I'm teaching uh, 464 in this flipped classroom style for the first time uh, for those lessons where I really was able to completely flip the classroom where students were able to work through material before they came to class uh, and we really used the class time for discussions and reinforcing uh, concept that was both for the students and for myself the best experience um, for myself as well uh, if you have to teach technical course content uh, at some point uh, it is uh, at least for me it's becoming very tricky to motivate myself to 
explain the syntax of how to define a variable each time, how to uh, define a list each time. So having this sort of stored in form of video material that students can work through also frees up my time to really focus on the more interesting, uh, interesting things. Uh, one thing that I have to say, though, so despite being able to leverage Linda as well as uh, Coy Rick, uh, it is still a substantial amount of work. So uh, I, of course, as many times underestimated how much work it will be in the end. Uh, so it is a work in progress that um, I am planning to pursue uh, and over the years uh, build up this court into a properly flipped, uh, flipped classroom experience. Um, the challenges, uh, this why it is uh, expensive. So um, one thing is that um, it is necessary uh, to design meaningful exercises outside of Linda. So uh, you don't want to give away solutions to students. Um, and you have to become creative in the way that you really engage them and make them work through uh, the materials. Um, I also found that it is most efficient to create in-class activities based on student responses and that of course requires a lot of time so identifying problem areas uh, that students uh, struggle with uh, that I don't know in advance uh, requires a lot of time in designing material around it um, and then of course uh, recording lecture materials in this professional manner so students get spoiled by the um, professional style in uh, Linda uh, and of course my own uh, recording capabilities are um, a lot less uh, less advanced uh, so maintaining this kind of Linda standard for uh, topics uh, is uh, challenging although um, a very uh, high and uh, high and uh, um, a good goal to uh, to have uh, and with that, I uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, if folks have questions, you can feel free to type it over in the box on the right. Uh, and I guess to get us started, I, I have one question, uh, Alex, and it has to do with uh, some of the, the what I might call admin features behind lynda.com. So I think the flip model is fantastic. Uh, as a member of teaching and learning with technology, we pitch it to a lot of faculty. <laughs> we yes. think it's very successful. It's awesome to hear that you're having a, a real success with it. But one of the big challenges we get in terms of folks that uh, are maybe a little apprehensive to use the model is how do I know that students are actually digesting this content before they show up in yes. class? Because the whole model is really predicated that you know, students are doing work outside of class and they're coming ready to engage in discussions, ready to engage in activities. And I was yes. curious if Linda has anything behind the scenes that you can kind of go and get a sense of, you know, how many people have watched the videos and that sort of stuff. Yes. Um, I have to admit that I have not explored Linda probably in all detail. So I would hope that there is such a thing so that I could officially sign up for using this course for my classes. Um, what I did at the moment, and uh, of course the students were then uh, smarter than me, uh, when you watch a Linda, Linda movie, when you go through, the, um, go through the course material, once you have watched a course, oh yeah, um, uh, then uh, a little uh, eye icon will appear behind, uh, behind the course, so I can Maybe I go quickly. So you can, uh, if you can see this slide now, uh, so once you have watched an icon, uh, you can, uh, you see this, uh, or in a section, you can see the little eye that indicates you have watched the, watched this section. Um, what I required students to do at the beginning was that uh, as a, another part of the assignment, I required them to submit a screenshot that showed that they had watched the, watched the, watched the, sections that I assigned, uh, but without showing this eye icon behind the uh, solution section for the challenges. <laughs> so uh, what I didn't know was that you can actually click on the eye icon and simply say, mark it as unwatched. <laughs> so, and that, of course, voids the purpose. Uh, what I also 
uh, had to learn again is that students may take you very literal um, and they indeed watched the watched the material but they didn't work through it uh, so the learning experience for me uh, is that um, as uh, with many other things as well I have to be extremely explicit what I want them to do so uh, rather saying then please work through uh, section or chapter one uh, sections uh, uh, one through five um, I really have to tell them you have to really follow the script execute the script and understand uh, what is in the end performed and how the syntax itself actually works and what I then also did is I created my own uh, exercises and challenges so instead of using what Linda offers I essentially used my own data sets and I made modifications so that students really had to work through uh, it in their own uh, or with their own thoughts and with their own uh, problems rather than at some point being able to say okay I have a sneak peek and look what the solution looks like but yeah it that is that is a one of the big challenges and this of course then also a part where then a lot of work externally has to come in um, I mean it will get better next year once I have gone through this uh, this first year experience uh, because then I have sort of my own tailored exercises again uh, but uh, it is a learning experience on both ends but once that was in place I think that the students also appreciated it it was more challenging uh, but the feedback that I got was that it is in the end more useful because they I basically robbed them of the possibility to uh, uh, sneak peek or to cheat so <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a great point in terms of uh, the first time you try something like this it's, it's a lot of work right uh, but you hope that the next time <laughs> yes. it's gonna have a big payoff and you know the more you work, the easier it gets you know, the more adjusted you are the more activities you have they've been your in your bank of activities you can roll yes. out so that's great uh, a couple of questions came here in the chat uh, Vicky asked what observations have you made on learning impact uh, improved grades better retention of material easier transition to higher level topics so have you made any observations about kind of the impact uh, that the flipped model has had in your course yeah so I mean there are a couple of things so the um, uh, I think that uh, the um, uh, so the, assessing the grades it's themselves that's probably a little bit tricky uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of the um, so it's a course that has a lot of um, projects assignment and homework assignments and they are normally normally pretty well done in the uh, in the first place and they get a lot of help so uh, it's it's probably difficult or it is difficult to make it on that assessment uh, or make an assessment on that level um, what definitely has happened is that the engagement with the material and the engagement and attentiveness in class is different so um, if you uh, especially for those who have taught like statistics courses and then maybe statistics courses in environments where this is uh, seen as the devil so geography students are not studying geography because they like statistics um, it is very difficult to motivate them to engage in the class material and this has changed so it is definitely the case that if you make students learn the material before they come to, or not learn but go through some of the material before they come to class they are a lot freer uh, in the way that they are voicing their opinions so the level of discussions that we had this year uh, is um, is far better than the level of discussions that I had before um, what is also the case is that if you have uh, ever tried to uh, teach uh, syntax so how to actually use R and R studio uh, in a classroom in your lectures it is an extremely time-consuming uh, effort because you never have students being there at the same pace 
So uh, my experience is that the background that students have is extremely diverse, which allows them to be either faster or they really need a lot more time. When you're in a lecture and you try to cater to everyone, then you have always students who are bored with what you're saying and you have students whom you lose. And you try to sort of come somewhere to the middle ground. Um, and with the Linda courses, I am actually able to allow students to go through material at their own pace, which may mean that some students take a bit longer and some students have, uh, have or are able to go through it faster. But in the end, uh, they are able, to, all of them are able to cover more material than I was able to actually uh, provide them uh, with uh, in, my, in my lectures. Um, and uh, it is also um, sort of from we have like we had like a um, informal assessment. Um, uh, students really like the kind of uh, scripts that they get or the challenges that they get then as in classroom material. Um, and so the assessment at this point in time is more uh, is more. Um, subjective uh, and qualitative. Uh, it would definitely be interesting to see um, how uh, this then works out with, for example, uh, the retention of the material um, or uh, to higher level concepts. Um, but as this is the first time that I'm teaching this course, um, I'm, uh, I'm essentially trying to get through uh, and uh, and enjoy the course as much as I can myself. And I think that's that's something that uh, is also useful for students in this uh, uh, context of rather dry material. Um, but it definitely would be nice to see at a, a later point uh, to really um, look into whether the course, the course material, the um, uh, course content, the acceptance of this course um, has improved uh, in re relation or in uh, comparison to previous years. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and that's from from an educational research or educational technology research perspective. I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe there's a way we can talk to the folks that run uh, Linda and see if we can start to generate some user logs from the students in your course and try and understand yes. you know, what types of students are, are using it heavily, are they performing well in the course, and things like that. So I think. Uh, I might, I might have to get back in touch with you later to see if there's a yes. way we might be able to do some digging around the edges to see, uh, you know, get a much better understanding of what's really happening. Yes. Yeah, I think that would be fantastic because uh, the way that I came to Linda was really through uh, finding it difficult to have my grad students uh, on a level of knowledge that so that they can actually go out and do interesting work. Uh, so, because the in geography and it's different in geography than, for example, in other uh, fields, uh, we do not have a very strict curriculum for our grad students. Uh, so you never know what they are actually able to do and what they are capable of doing. So for um, for grad students, that was a fantastic tool because they're really interested to be able to do something and to learn something and get something out of it and then being able to apply it to their own research topics. Uh, but for the undergraduate level, I completely agree. It would be great uh, to be able to integrate it in a way such that you have actually knowledge about how much of the material uh, is actually um, is actually absorbed, how often do they interact with it, uh, and so on and so forth. Not just through the assessment, which is sort of an indirect way, uh, but also through um, actually quantitative data that shows how, how often they interact with it, how they use it, when they use it, maybe, ev maybe even on which kind of devices they use it. So is it really the case that this frees or yeah, liberates them to um, engage with the course material wherever they are. So are they sitting in a coffee shop and, and learning course content now, uh, rather than being forced to uh, come to a lab, for example, uh, and having to do everything there? Um, I didn't, I'm not sure that I mentioned, so I haven't talked about advantages of R, uh, but uh, one of the big advantages is actually that it's free uh, and also the environment that we are using. Uh, and that, of course, is a tremendous advantage um, that uh, basically allows students to 
combine this online education uh, with the freedom of doing it on whatever computer they have administer rights on and essentially doing it wherever they, they want to. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we're, uh, so, so we're involved in MOOCs, right, as you're probably aware. And that's one of the things we're looking at with all the data that Coursera sends us is uh, uh, what kind of devices do we see people coming into yeah. our Coursera courses with. And it's been interesting looking at the devices in uh, conjunction with the geographic location, right, to, to understand where certain, certain uh, places in the world, cell phones are much more prevalent than laptops and desktops, and start to see, you know, certain pockets across the world develop that the, the majority of people are coming in with certain devices. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yes. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, so I guess with that, uh, thank you very much, Alex. We'll wrap up, and I believe, uh, Brad, we're going to try and get this up online, the recording at some point on the COIL website. Yeah, well, actually, within the hour, you should be able to go to coil.psu.edu, and you'll see the recording up there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you for attending. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye.